OK, I think that's all the admin stuff I needed to say. Anything else? Good. OK. That allows me to finally get to content. So there's another reason to be really excited about doing this school, which is the very first time we're doing something like this, a large scale spring school, summer school, whatever you want to call it, format for probabilistic numerics. And it's exciting to see so many people here in this room interested in this field, which up until quite recently was a very small community. For me, probabilistic numerics was always about building numerical algorithms, algorithms for AI and machine learning, because that's the field that my group has always been in and that we've always worked in. Now, there is another reason why it's exciting to do this event at, a, at exactly this point in time, because, of course, AI and machine learning is going through an absolutely monumental change right now with large-scale modeling, large language models, generative AI. What I'm going to try and tell you in this opening talk, which is going to do triple duty as an introduction talk, as a quick outlook on all the things you're going to get to see over the next two days, and also a motivational talk, my main message that I'm, trying, that I'm going to try and convey is that there has hardly ever been a better time to enter research or to do research on algorithms for AI and machine learning, in particular from this perspective. And you will see, I mean, of course I say that because that's what we do, but I hope I can convince you with some arguments. So probabilistic numerics is about describing computation in the language of machine learning and AI. That's at least my way of thinking about it. Why should we think about it this way? So here's the classic pitch. A, a, a machine learning algorithm, if you ask the media, is a computer program that adapts a model to data. That's correct, but actually both of these words, model and data, are in some sense external to the machine that does the learning. The data comes from the outside world, and the model is provided by a human who writes it down, describes it in code. What the computer actually does when it learns is the solution of a computational problem. And in contrast to classic AI, where that problem was usually, so by classic AI, I mean like the 70s, right? where those problems used to be Turing computable functions like graph cuts and shortest paths. In machine learning and in AI, those comp computational problems are invariably numerical problems. So a numerical problem is a computational question that has no closed form answer. They are optimization problems for fitting and estimating, for example, in deep learning. They are integration problems for probabilistic inference, so for um, computing conditionals and marginals and expected values. They are the solution to differential equations. That's actually a relatively new emerging topic. Well, already a few years, but so we used to, th I used to think that, that the, the main point where differential equations would show up in machine learning are whenever an autonomous system, whenever an acting agent interacts with a data source, like a robot or an, a reinforcement learning agent, it invariably has to predict what happens next in the world, so to simulate, solve differential equations, so that it can decide how to act in the present to create a positive future, right? One that, it, an outlook that minimizes some loss. That's still true, but actually, we have seen increasingly more uses of differential equations in machine learning and AI over the past few years. The two most important examples are on the one hand, score-based diffusion models, the stuff that produces the images that you see on some of the slides here, which are essentially differential equation solvers for ordinary or stochastic differential equations. And, and I'm going to talk about this for a few moments, in scientific machine learning, we increasingly see models that, that explicitly use the laws of nature, so things like the Schrodinger equation or the Maxwell's equations or Navier-Stokes, which are differential equations, to describe models as well. And then there's linear algebra, because linear algebra is a special case, or the basic case, of all of the above. Linear algebra to solve 
quadratic or least squares optimization problems, otherwise also known as Gaussian process inference, linear algebra to solve Gaussian integrals, otherwise known as Gaussian inference, and linear algebra to solve linear differential equations, otherwise known as linear Gaussian systems. So these problems, though, they are not new. They are actually much older than machine learning and AI. They were invented by, you know, for optimization by operations research people in, well, well a long time ago, so economists. By, in the case of integration, Markov J. Monte Carlo, by physicists during the Manhattan Project, by, for differential equations by applied mathematicians over 100 years ago, Runge and Kutta, 1905 and before. And, well, don't even get me started on linear algebra. So what that means is that whenever this new field, AI and machine learning, encountered these numerical problems in their descriptions of what they are trying to do, they invariably discovered that there were already algorithms out there ostensibly for these problems. And that was good because it meant that this field could move very fast by using libraries. These days, Python libraries, but it used to be, you know, MATLAB toolboxes. But it's also a problem because, as I'm going to argue in the, in the rest of this talk, machine learning and AI actually pose specific challenges that these classic methods are absolutely not designed to address well. And they have all something to do with the fact that data plays this central role in this field. That data is the way that information enters the computation, which it didn't in classic scientific computing. Right? The classic perspective on computing is someone goes out into the field, collects some numbers, puts them in a logbook, puts them on plotting paper, draws a line, decides what the rule is, and then put that, puts that equation into a computer, and the data is gone. So I'm going to argue that because of this role of data, we need new numerical algorithms. And what good news, then, that if machine learning needs new algorithms, that the, new, that the numerical methods that we already use actually are learning machines as well. Because what a numerical algorithm actually is, is a computer program that estimates an unknown quantity, like the location of a minimum of a function, or the value of an integral, or the solution of a differential equation, or the solution of a linear system of equations, and a large number of them, given a bunch of observed stuff, like values of gradients, values of the integrand, values of the vector field that drives the, different, the, the dynamical system, or matrix vector products. So in every case, these algorithms estimate an unknown quantity, a latent quantity, here called Z, given an observable, a computable quantity, here called C. And clearly, that's exactly the same process as in machine learning. We're estimating latent quantities from data. It's just that the data doesn't come from the real world. It's not collected on a disk and then read into the computation, but it comes directly from the chip, from the CPU or the GPU or whatever your hardware is. But other than that, it's the exact same process. And just like you can have a Bayesian probabilistic perspective on machine learning and describe pretty much all of contemporary machine learning as some form or approximation to Bayesian inference over the latent quantities in the model, you can think about computation as an approximation to or a, a variant of or some view on Bayesian inference over the latent quantities Z given some computation C. And algorithms that use this viewpoint, for me, are probabilistic numerical methods. That's actually as vague as I'm going to stay. I'm going to say a probabilistic numerical method is an algorithm that computes a, the, the solution to a non-analytical task or approximates it by applying some form of Bayesian inference. I'm not going to be more precise for several reasons. One of them is that tomorrow morning, we're having the presentation by Tim Sullivan, who is our resident like, rig rigorous mathematician. And so I'm not even going to try and uh, be as formal as he's going to be tomorrow morning. I'm sure he's, he, he can tell you what a probabilistic numerical algorithm actually should be. The other reason is that we recently wrote a book on this. So if you'd like to more, know more, um, you can download our textbook that uh, Mike Osborne and Hans and I wrote that contains more definitions of this form. One thing I can say, though, is that this perspective that 
you can think of computation like this can actually be applied to various classic numerical algorithms. We can see that methods like conjugate gradients and also Cholesky decompositions in linear algebra, Runge-Kutta methods in simulation, uh, all Gaussian quadrature methods, thanks to work by Tony, by the way, who is sitting here somewhere uh, in the audience. There he is. Um, and um, pretty much all quasi-Newton methods like DFGS can all be interpreted as computing the mode of a Gaussian posterior that arises from multiplying a Gaussian process prior with a likelihood that amounts to a point distribution, a Dirac delta. So we can take the classic numerical methods as a starting point from which we can deviate to create new functionality for AI and machine learning. And why would you do that? Well, one of like, maybe the most immediate first advantage that is sort of immediately obvious is that doing so produces a posterior, and posteriors are structured quantifications of uncertainty. By structured, I mean not an error bar, not just one number that gets spit out as a side result of the algorithm, but actually an object that you can ask questions to, that you can ask to sample from, that you can derive answers to derived questions uh, to. But actually, we've often found that this uncertainty itself is not the immediately useful output. Much like in Bayesian machine learning. When you first encounter a Bayesian machine learning model, like a Gaussian process, you, you, people, you, you, you end up marveling at the posterior uncertainty. It looks really beautiful. But then you realize that if you actually want to do something with it, there's usually a derived step afterwards that actually leads to useful um, functionality. And I'm going to show you a few examples just now to show that um, this kind of uncertainty can be derived to actually do things that are genuinely valuable for AI and machine learning. In particular, this viewpoint allows us to combine different sources of information of very different, qualitatively different type. And you need uncertainty to be able to do that. If you have two different people telling you something, you need to know how much to rely on each of them in a structured fashion to combine their information. And much like that, you need to know how, how much to trust individual sources of information to compute a prediction for um, a derived quantity. And then when you, when you do that, you can then also control how much you invest in the individual sources of information, how much into compute and how much into collecting data. And another really cool thing that I'll talk about at the end is that if you have a description that already assumes a likelihood in the computation, but for the classic numerical methods, that likelihood just happens to be a point distribution. Then we can generalize and relax this description to allow for imprecise forms of computation, for actual likelihoods in the computation. And that then becomes interesting in a field that now increasingly uses very unreliable computation, stochastic forms of computation, and otherwise computations that are incomplete. So, that's the high-level idea of what a probabilistic numerical method is. And now I want to use the rest of my time to try and convince you that this is a cool thing to do even at the time of ChatGPT and stable diffusion and all the other new emerging technologies in AI. In fact, I'm going to argue that this is the best time to do this research, and this is the best kind of research to do at this point in time. Why? Well, I actually have three different examples that I'll go through. And they kind of address the three different perspectives that I currently see people might have on this emerging changes in AI and ML. There's sort of three, three ways you can react, at least I think one can react to these developments. The first one, the one that I want to talk about first is, maybe you're just annoyed by all of this and you want to stay out of it. You think it's weird or maybe dangerous or just ugly and dirty and imprecise and you want to do some proper math and stay out of all of these problems. If, you, if that's your perspective, which by the way is a, I think a perfectly fine way of thinking about this, then you might want to look at parts of AI and machine learning that have pretty much nothing to do with natural language processing and computer vision and still contain a lot of things to do. And in my opinion, the most interesting domain of this type is scientific machine learning. Arguably, scientific inference still contains the most, like the largest amount of potential for advances in like real world impactful advances uh, from AI and machine learning. So things like 
climate modeling, predicting the properties of materials and automatically designing materials that are, I don't know, high temperature superconductors, uh, predicting how proteins fold and um, uh, building robots, arguably, that's maybe not really scientific, but more technological, right? Like new ways of doing quanti quantitative agriculture. All of these clearly very important applications are quite different from natural language processing and computer vision. They are actually qualitatively different in the following sense. So in computer vision and natural language processing, we have a lot of data. The data sets are huge. They're basically exascale now. The entire internet is the data set. So the data provides a lot of information. But on the other hand, it's very difficult to write down prior information. A prior in natural language, it's very difficult to write a generative model for natural sentences or natural images. So the models are very unstructured and large, and the data sets provide all the information. In science, it's quite the opposite. Every datum is expensive. It's often ethically expensive as well. One data point might be a human life in the most extreme case. So it, they cost a lot of time and money and ethical resources. But on the other hand, we have strong priors in the form of previous data condensed into scientific laws of nature. Maxwell's equations, the Schrodinger equation, Navier-Stokes, and so on. These are typically in the form of symmetries, conserved quantities, partial differential equation that provide information about the world but that information comes in the form of some nonlinear equation, which can't just be included in the computation in closed form. And that has meant that historically, quite interestingly, I think, two different communities have emerged. On the one hand, we have statistics, which these days is sort of morphed into parts of machine learning, which concerns itself with extracting information from data collected in the world, and on the other hand, we have high-performance computing, or let's call it applied mathematics, which concerns itself with extracting information from differential equations. And those two communities have lived side by side, and of course they know of each other, they even use each other's tools, but the tools have not quite morphed into one joint toolbox. And I'll give you an example of why that is a problem. And now that data is really central to the computation, it's time to break the separation between computation and data processing on either side. To explain to you why, uh, what I mean by this and how I think it should work, I'm going to use a very simple example that comes from a paper by Jonathan and Nico from New Rips in 2021. Um, some of you may have seen this data set before. These are COVID case counts from Germany from the first one and a half years of the pandemic, um, the first three waves of COVID rolling through uh, Germany. So this is a time series. It's clearly a scientific problem. And the natural question on everyone's mind back then in the summer of 2021 was not, not just of scientists, but everyone in society was, how does this time series cont continue on the right? What happens next? Will there be one more wave? Is it over? Can we go outside again? So let's look at this problem from the perspective of these, of these two straw man communities that I just made up, right? high performance computing and applied mathematics and statistics. If you are a straw man machine learning or statistician scientist, then your natural reaction might be, well, let's use one of my favorite tools from my toolbox on this problem. Let's say a VLU feed forward neural network, right? I can train this on this time series and what I get is this, which looks bad at first, but actually let me point out that it's a pretty good solution because there is a gray line here that goes through all of the data points. Right? It fits to the data. It uses the data as information sources. But then it extrapolates really badly on the right. Um, actually, it doesn't extrapolate. It looks like it's at zero. It's not actually at zero. It's a linear extrapolation. It just happens to be that the gain of the curve is very low. Um, this is a property of real networks that they extrapolate linearly because they are a linear combination of like, piecewise linear functions. So they have to be linear functions. Um, if you don't like that prediction, you can use something else from your favorite toolbox. You can use a Gaussian process regressor with some kernel that allows you to extrapolate, I don't know, polynomially or in some smooth fashion or even exponentially. But none of these are useful, right? Because none of these extrapolations have anything to do with the causal mechanism that drives this dynamical system. 
So the alternative is to include the law of nature that drives the system, and that law of nature is a differential equation. In this case, it's an ordinary differential equation. Um, so at an equation that relates a time derivative of some curve to some nonlinear function of that curve and a bunch of other parameters. In particular, it's this SIR type model. So um, I'm sure many of you have seen these models before. We separate the population into three groups, susceptible S, infectious I, and we covered R. And then we write down what we think actually happens. So when susceptible people, people and infected people meet, um, which has something to do with how many of them there are, then the susceptible people get infected and they move into the infectious group. And then once they are there, after a while, with some rate, they move into the recovered group. This is, of course, the textbook version of this equation. There are much more complicated formats of it, right? You can include groups for diseased people. You can have reinfection mechanisms. You can have each of these SINRs can be entire vectors that describe spatial statistics, and this becomes a partial differential equation. I'm going to ignore all of this because I'm just trying to make a little argument, right? So this is the kind of thing that you can send to a differential equation solver. That's, that's what the tools of the applied mathematics community are for. And this is what these things look like. Actually, that's the most famous, most widely used tool for this particular type of problem. It's a Runge-Kutta method of order 4-5, written by Heira and Wanner in, oh, I've cut off the last comment, something like 1980 something. The key thing about this piece of code is that it requires you to provide the function, so that's the right-hand side of the differential equation, and then uh, the initial point, the initial value, and the end point of the integration. So what this thing asks us to provide, and then the, the other stuff, all the white stuff is just tolerances that you can actually leave out. What this thing asks us to provide is something we don't actually have, this equation on the right-hand side, because that equation contains a thing, beta, which we don't know. Beta is the contact rate, tells us how often people actually meet. So what I'd like to do is to be able to, to tell this code, there's this function, but actually I only have a partial form of it. I'd like to do some functional programming with this with the differential equation solver to just say, there is this function, but it depends on this beta, and I don't know yet what beta is. Do your thing, but keep in mind that I don't know what beta is. But this code can't do that, because it comes from 1905, basically. I mean, from 1980, but it's an, a structure of algorithm from 1905. So this thing asks us to provide something we don't have. And if we don't have it, we have to guess it, right? So we set, set beta to 0.2, then we get this curve, which is nice and smooth. But arguably, it's even worse than this stupid network that I showed you before, because it has literally nothing to do with the data. It just, it's just a curve. The red dots have nothing to do with this output. So to fix this, what I would like to be able to do is to take this piece of code and say this function bit up there, I can only evaluate that partially. There's some part of it that I don't have yet. But I have something else. I have some data, the red dots, and I'd like to add those to the arguments of this, of this code. Say comma data, right? Now we can't do that. But we can do something else. We can, do, we can take this code and wrap something around it, a big bow. And that's exactly actually what people do. So that's the two communities talking to each other, if you like, the, the, the simulation people and the statistics people. So uh, this comes under names like simulation-based inference or approximate Bayesian computation or neural ODEs, depending on who you ask and which uh, university you're working at. Um, the idea is always pretty much the same. We're going to take this red thin curve, the output of the, of the algorithm, and the red dots, and we define a loss function on the two, for example, the square difference between them. Then we re-implement this Fortran code I just showed you in a language that allows automatic differentiation, like Julia or Jax. And then we compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the curve x times the derivative of the curve x with respect to beta times the derivative of beta with respect to however we want to parameterize it. So maybe it's a neural network, and then it's just the weights of the neural network. And then we can call Adam and just wait. <laughs>
What this does is it repeatedly calls this ODE solver over and over and over and over again. And what it completely ignores is the fact that in this ODE solver, there's another for loop that moves from left to right through the data, looking at one datum after the other. And every computer scientist knows that nested for loops are potentially dangerous or that they are sources of trouble. So the probabilistic perspective from computation allows us to break up this, comp this separation on a very, very fundamental level and directly use both sources of information in what I would call correct, in the correct way. And I'm not going to tell you how this works because we have an entire day tomorrow with talks by Simo and Nico and Nathanael to tell you about how to build such algorithms, but I'm going to give you the high level idea. So these solvers for differential equations from the probabilistic perspective, they're called probabilistic ODE solvers, or a special type of them called probabilistic or ODE filters or differential equation filters, they are based around an algorithmic backbone, a spine in the form of a Markov chain. So it looks like this, where each, where this X, this capital X is a state space that contains all the variables we want to model. So in this case, it's S and I and R and time derivatives of S and I and R and second time derivatives of, time derivatives of S and I and R maybe. And we assume that they, so we define a prior on these variables by assuming that they follow a linear Gaussian um, dynamics description, right? a stochastic differential equation of linear Gaussian type. That's a Markov chain. And that's good because there is a fundamental type of algorithm, Bayesian filters and smoothers, which Simu, I'm sure, will tell you about, um, which allow very fast inference in these kind of problems in a single forward and potentially a backward pass. Now we can inform this backbone about this nonlinear differential equation in, by including a finite number of individual terms that Philip Tronarp, where is he over there, calls information operators. So these are terms that the algorithm actively decides to put at certain points that tell this filter and smoother that the difference between x dot, which is a part of the state space, and some nonlinear function of x, which is also part of the state space, is zero. So that's what the differential equation says, right? If f were linear, everything would just be Gaussian inference, but f isn't linear, so we'll need some cool machinery that you'll hear about tomorrow. Um, but that is, a, is actually, as it turns out, very, very close to how classic ODE solvers work as well. And because it explicitly includes a finite number of observations, the algorithm is aware that it's imprecise because it has discretized the problem. Now, as the algorithm passes from left to right, we can do something else, though. We can also inform the algorithm about some data that we have collected about the system elsewhere, those red dots, the data points. And they can be included in this filtering and smoothing loop, actually pass forward and backward, at the very same time, so in the same forward-backward pass. And the information gleaned from, this extra informa from these extra um, data points can be used to infer quantities that we don't know yet, like those latent forces. If you do this, and this is, all of this is a single forward-backward pass, so it costs roughly as much as a single ODE solve, then you get an output that looks like this, which on the top is, as you can see, a prediction for the dynamical system that goes through the data, so it uses the data points. It's uncertain in a structured, fa structured fashion, so it uh, produces a meaningfully uncertain estimate on the right. And at the very same time, it produces an estimate for the latent force, beta, in yellow below. And you can see that both of these are stochastic processes, so they produce a structured output. That's what I mean by structured uncertainty. We can jointly sample from these two processes. Actually, there are three curves in each plot, and they correspond to each other. So this particular hypothesis down here corresponds to this dynamic up here, and that's actually a solution to a differential equation under this hypothesis. And you see structured uncertainty, so sometimes this thing is more or less uncertain, and this uncertainty has something to do with the algebraic relationship between the variable beta and the variable i that we get to observe. Why? Well, if you go back to this uh, ODE for a moment, you notice that beta only ever shows up in this differential equation in a product with i. And that means the Jacobian of this function here with respect to beta as a function of i is zero whenever i is zero, right? 
which makes sense because if you're using sick people to probe society for how often people meet, then you can't do that if there are no sick people, right? And the fewer sick people there are, the less you're going to learn about the contact rate. And that's exactly what we see in here. So in the time early on in the pandemic, when there were no cases, we were maximally uncertain. And then in phases with low case counts, we were also uncertain. This is, to, for me, an, the archetype of the kind of algorithms we were looking for, which seamlessly combine computational information and empirical information from data. And you're going to hear from Simo and Nico and Nathanael tomorrow how these algorithms work, how to build them. Actually, Nathanael is going to build one of them with you. So that's my recommendation for what to do if you don't care about AGI at all. Just do scientific machine learning. There's a lot of really cool things to do. And there's another approach, another view you might have on this development, which might be that you're really worried about it and that you want to help to fix it. So maybe you think that rapid development of these large-scale AI models is very dangerous because these things are very difficult to control. So you'd like to help to make them more controllable, more understandable. My argument is going to be that maybe one of the best ways to achieve this, to contribute to this goal, is to do numerical linear algebra. Doesn't sound like the first thing to do, but let me see if I can convince you. So in machine learning, at least the undergraduate machine learning, we tend to learn about linear algebra in the context of Gaussian processes. So hands up, this is a really interesting question for this kind of audience, because I'd like to find out who you all have, and maybe John wants to find out as well. How many of you could answer the question what a Gaussian process is? That's by far the majority. Very good. That's what I was, was expecting. And how many of you have implemented the textbook version of a Gaussian process before yourself in whatever language you like? That's also almost everyone. That's very good because then I can rapidly tell you what, what's going on here. So you've then all seen these equations, which are up here on the top. Maybe you haven't seen them exactly in this form, but you all know that to do Gaussian process inference, you get a data set which has locations X and labels Y, and you need to build this big matrix called G, which is called the Gram matrix. And then you need to compute these two objects that describe the posterior of the Gaussian process, like inference machinery, posterior mean, posterior covariance. And to do that, you have to solve this equation, which is usually written as kernel times Gram matrix inverse times residual. And posterior covariance is kernel minus something with the Gram matrix inverse. And now, depending on where you've studied all of this, someone may have told you that this entire process is cubically expensive in the number of data points available. And then, therefore, kernel machines are out and deep learning is in. Because why would you do something that's cubically expensive if you have the super powerful stuff around that is linearly expensive in the data set? Well, that's actually a convenient lie because it's a worst case statement. And what you're going to hear, at least this is my version of what you're going to hear from John and Jonathan later today, is that linear algebra is, a, is maybe the most interesting and in, intricate point where data and computation meet. Because we tend to think of Gaussian process inference as this, this two-part process. There is data coming in, a data set, and the data set has n elements. And then we switch on the big linear algebra machinery, and it rumbles and takes a long time, and then it spits out the solution. Cholesky, right? But actually, linear algebra is really just bookkeeping. And when you understand how linear algebra methods work, you realize that they're pretty much just an efficient way of loading data from disk. So there's not really a reason to separate the posterior Gaussian process computation from the process of reading data. So now once you allow yourself well, the following observation, maybe your, your, your perspective changes. If I tell you that I have a data set on disk that contains n numbers, how much that does, does that tell you? Not very much, right? I have to first actually show you the data for you to do anything with it. So data that just sits on disk might as well not be there. It's a bit useless. What you actually know, so what you encode in your posterior covariance, should have something to do with what you've done with your data. So if you allow yourself to think that only once I've actually computed on the data set do I learn from it, and I should only track the uncertainty that emerges from that computation 
rather than from the fact that there is some data set sitting somewhere, then you can suddenly do really interesting things. You can load the entire data set and step through it and wait for the algorithm to find the perfect answer. That's called computer Bicholesky decomposition. And it is, in fact, cubically expensive in the data set side. You could also allow the algorithm to not look at the entire data set, but to project the data set and the Gram matrix, which is part of the data set essentially, it onto a set of projections. Right? You compute a bunch of projections of that matrix and a bunch of projections of that data set. And that's, of course, going to be quadratically expensive for each projection because you have to project that matrix. But that will create a new data set for you, a projected one on which you can do inference. That's called iterative linear algebra. So you can call it conjugate gradient or some variants of it. And then that's going to be quadratically expensive in the data set size and linearly expensive in the number of steps. Or you could decide to only look at some rows or columns of that matrix and ignore all the other ones. That's linearly expensive because each row is of length n. It's also less efficient because you can't spend the time to construct the perfect, the best, most informative projections. But it's also a way of collecting a form of a data set that's called inducing point methods. And it's linearly expensive in the data set size. Or you could decide to just ignore entire parts of the data set and never look at them and just look at the subpart of this Gram matrix. That's called a sketching method or a subset of data regression method. And that's independent of data set size. So in linear algebra, we really have the freedom to do anything from super fast to super expensive. And if we take care to quantify the uncertainty emerging from this computational decision, then maybe we don't even have to think about the data set at all because we are still quantifying what we're supposed to quantify. So in Gaussian process regression, there is this very deep connection between data processing and data collection, if you like, reading in data. It's pretty much the same thing. So why should you care about Gaussian processes? Huh? Right? So that maybe this like, helps understand why they are sort of interesting from a computational perspective, but why should anyone still care about Gaussian processes in a time of GPT? Well, let me tell you just for a moment that all deep networks are actually Gaussian processes. You just haven't looked at them correctly yet. So here's my argument for why everything is actually a Gaussian process and why thinking about deep nets as a Gaussian process is already more powerful than what you're currently doing with deep nets, but barely more expensive. So what do we actually do when we do deep learning? Well, we write down a loss function. Here we are. We're trying to find the minimum of a loss function over a parameter space. Those parameters are called the weights. Um, and that loss function has a certain property. It's typically a big sum over n, that's the size of the data set, individual terms where each term is a little loss that depends on one datum, so in the supervised case, one pair of x and y, and a function that we call a deep neural network that depends on a bunch of parameters called the weights. And then there may or may not be a regularizer, so a term that only depends on the weights, theta. And that might well be zero, that's a special case. Okay, so that's how you write down a deep learning problem, and then you call your optimizer on this function with a data loader. So you can notice that these functions here, they depend on data and parameter. So maybe we can think of them as something like a negative log likelihood. Negative because we're minimizing it. And this here only depends on the weight, so we can think of it as something like a prior, a negative log prior, actually, because we're minimizing it. So finding the minimum of this function is like finding the maximum of minus this function, so the maximum of the sum of log prior and likelihood. And because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation, that's the same as finding the maximum of a posterior. So deep learning is essentially point estimation in a maximum a posteriori type fashion, if you do it this way. Now, that's fine, and that's what everyone actually does, um, but it's also bad. It has some fundamental pathologies that have something to do with the fact that you're doing point estimation. Here is one example of these pathologies. Over here, you see a four-class classification problem, a, a toy one, so that I can make a plot of four classes, one, two, three, four, and I've trained a two-layer ReLU feedforward classifier with cross-entropy loss on this problem, and what you see as a shading in the background is a confidence score. So you can see that there are four classes, basically, right? The, the classifier has decided to create four regions, 
and you see just the confidence of the classifier in those regions. And you can see that as you move far away from the data, this thing is dark red. The, class, the classifier is super confident about the class. And it turns out that that's actually not an accident for this particular setup. It's a fundamental property of VLU classifiers combined with point estimation. That's a result that my colleague Matthias Hein here from Tübingen showed in a wonderful CVPR paper in 2019. If you go arbitrarily far away from the data in a VLU classifier, you will always get an arbitrarily confident prediction of one class, actually almost always. So point estimation is just wrong. It has always been just wrong, and Bayesians and probabilists have been saying that in machine learning for a long time, we should fix it. The problem is just that it seems like fixing it requires full Bayesian inference, and that's very expensive, so no one is doing it. Let's see if we can do it with a little bit of linear algebra. So what we could do is we could say maybe we can be a little bit more Bayesian than just a point estimate by using the tools available in the deep learning stack. So we take this loss function, and at the minimum, so at the point where the gradient is zero, we construct a second-order Taylor approximation over the weights. What does that entail? Well, it means that we first train the network in whichever way you like, with Adam or whatever. You find the point where theta star lies, where the gradient is zero. And then you use autodiff to construct this term. So that's a quadratic term in the weights that contains a matrix in the middle that is the Hessian, the second derivative of the loss function. If we think of our posterior approximately as this, so notice that this is strictly stronger than what we were previously doing in deep learning. So it's strictly stronger than just assuming that the loss looks like this by adding a term to it. Then we can think of our log posterior as a quadratic function. And so the posterior, therefore, is a Gaussian, right? e to the minus a Gaussian, as e to the minus a quadratic form. And that Gaussian contains a mean, which is the thing we've just trained, the trained weights of the deep neural network, and a covariance function that is minus the inverse of the Hessian. So inverses, that's a little bit like a Gaussian process regression. There is something in there that we shouldn't actually compute, but for which we should spend some time doing linear algebra. And we need to do that linear algebra on what? On a function of the data. So we need to think about how we process the data when we do this linear algebra. And in fact, it's exactly the same kind of linear algebra we need to do for Gaussian process regression. And in fact, it also gives us a Gaussian process. Well, first of all, it gives us a Gaussian on the weights. Fine. How do we turn that into a Gaussian process on the deep neural network? Easy. We just take a linearization of the, of the neural network. So we take this f, which shows up in this loss up there. And we also do a Taylor approximation around theta star, but only to first order. So that tells us that the deep network is given by the trained deep network, the thing everyone's currently using, plus a linear term, which depends on the Jacobian of the network with respect to its parameters. So that's a matrix, a rectangular matrix, that is a function of the input x, multiplied by the distance between the trained net and the parameter theta. If we assume, if you approximate our network in this way, we can marginalize over this approximate Gaussian and end up with a Gaussian process on our deep neural network, which has a mean function given by the trained deep neural network. So it's the thing you're currently using if you're doing deep learning. And a kernel, a covariance function, a posterior covariance function given by the Jacobian of the deep net multiplied from the left and the right with this linear algebra object that we had to construct on the weight space. So first of all, this is not new. It's not my idea either. So Laplace approximations, this idea of constructing a curvature estimate, they were introduced in deep learning by David Mackay in 1990 something, 1992, I think. But I mean, they're called Laplace approximations, so they are a few hundred years old. And this linearization trick is something that was discussed by people like MTS Kahn and Alex Immer and uh, Eric Daxberger and Runa Eschenhagen and Agostinos Christiadi over the years over and over again and has actually developed into a whole like, language on doing fast Bayesian inference on deep learning. What does it require? Well, it requires automatic differentiation that's available in the machine learning stack and probabilistic thinking for the linear algebra in here because this computation here 
contains all of the weights and all of the data, potentially. So we, need to so we need to think about how to do it right. And how to think about that, I'll tell you in the next part. But first of all, I need to show you that if you do that, and if you look at the plot over there on the right, and marginalize over the weights, it's like switching on the lights. You suddenly get meaningful uncertainty. It fixes the problem entirely. And you can even show, show with a proof that it actually fixes this asymptotic overconfidence correctly. So how to build this kind of machinery and how to think about linear algebra in computation, you will hear about from John and Jonathan today, actually right after this presentation, well, after the coffee break. And why is this important? Because we need quantified uncertainty in large scale deep learning models to be able to, to ask them how confident they are in their prediction, to check whether, a, whether an input actually is close to the training data or not, to um, guide them in their training process, to check things like differential privacy and fairness and all the other ethical considerations of deep learning. None of these are possible without a probability measure on the output of the network. So we need algorithms that are efficient, as efficient as the current deep learning stack or more, to produce this probabilistic output. And as you can see, it's within reach. It's just one extra backward pass, right, by the way, right? So once you have this linear algebra, the extra cost of doing that is just this matrix. And that matrix is a backward pass. That's it. So at test time, you just do one back backward pass and you get uncertainty. So on this uh, slide, you also see Roman, who isn't here yet because he's still waking up from his jet lag. He's, gonna, he's going to be the bridge between Gaussian processes and deep learning. You have a question. So your, so your question is, your question is, if you're not actually at a minimum, or if there are many minim minima, what do we do? Yeah, then this approach is imperfect. But actually, I mean, yes, it's imperfect, but you could ask the exact same question about the point estimate up there, right? Why is everyone using just one trained deep neural network if there are many multi minima? Why are they stopping their training if they don't know that they are in a minimum? So yes, it's totally a problem, and you are very much invited to work on making things even more powerful. But just, just to be clear, this is only adding good things, right? It's only making the prediction more meaningful by adding a probability measure. And it, it inherits the problems that already exist, so there needs to be orthogonal fixes to those. Yeah, good point, though. So we're going to have Roman in the evening, afternoon, the final thing today, um, which I think is going to be a nice way to close the day. And Roman will talk about his book on Bayesian optimization that you may have seen, which is a nice segue into the final part of my presentation. So I said, if you don't care for AGI at all, do scientific machine learning. If you're concerned about AGI and you want to make it controllable, add uncertainty to deep learning everywhere by adding probabilistic computational functionality to the deep learning stack. But as a final thing, final way you can approach this development, which is all in. Amazing, HEI is around the corner. I want to make it even faster and even more powerful, right? In my opinion, the way to do that, which is also a perfectly valid, valid approach at this point at least, is to build better algorithms. Because there's now an entire industry of people building models. You're not going to outcompete OpenAI in building a better transformer architecture, but you can contribute to how to actually build algorithms for deep learning and large-scale machine learning. Why? Because the deep learning algorithm stack, quite in contrast to the deep learning model stack, is actually very immature. It's not really what it should be. So in um, last New Rips, so early December last year, Frank Schneider and, is he here, is Frank here? No. Um, and uh, I and a bunch of uh, people from, from Google, uh, Zach Nado and uh, George uh, Dahl, we co-organized a workshop called Has It Trained Yet? Um, 
uh, so George and Zach are working in the large language model part of uh, Google Brain. And we invited basically a bunch of people who work on large deep learning problems to discuss how, what the state of the art is of training a deep net. And we had people like Susan Zhang from Meta who trained OPT, like, so Facebook's large, large language model at the time, and uh, people who trained Palm for Google, and um, Boris Dema who, who trained uh, Dali Mini on, on, on Hugging Face, and basically um, lots of people, who, and Jimmy Barr, right? Lot, lot, lots of people who, who really should know how to train deep nets. They may be the world's leading experts on training deep nets. The only people we didn't have there were OpenAI, at least not officially, they might be, have been sitting in the room. And the takeaway was that no one really knows how to train a deep net. There are these teams now at OpenAI, at Facebook, at Google, who spend literally billions of dollars and months of team effort, so many person years, sitting in front of a piece of software that has knobs to twist and turning them seemingly randomly to make them work. That's really not, not a particularly bad description of what's going on. In fact, we asked the audience at the conference and on Twitter, how do you train your deep net? We asked a lot of questions. Here are just three answers from this questionnaire. Um, I have to explain what these plots mean. So on the outside ring, you see the total answers. And then we made a bit of a mistake. We asked people, are you an academic or are you working in industry? And the inner ring is the academics and the, out, the middle ring is the industry researchers. So the problem is that, that there's a big confounder here. I think the people who answered I'm an academic typically were PhD students. And the people who said I'm an in industry were typically postdoctoral industry engineers and researchers. So you should think of the inner ring as younger people and the middle ring as more professional people, let's say. Uh, and so the, one of the first questions we ask people is, what do you actually do to decide how to choose algorithms for your optimizer? So these, what, what are these variables or these parameters for the optimizers, by the way? They are things like the learning rate, the weird variable called beta 1, beta 2, and epsilon in Adam that you probably all know, but there's also not much of a better name for them. Um, things like the batch size, the decay rate of the learning rate, the ramp up rate of the learning rate, and so on and so on. And about 10% of the respondents, which is actually about 17% of the industry researchers, said that they're using Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization being maybe the most successful probabilistic numerical algorithm out there at the moment. So it's not great, but it's, there's a significant chunk of the industry out there using a probabilistic numerical method to decide how to set parameters. What this does is effectively treating computation as a data source very concretely, really just a big computation returning answers that you can then do regression over. Sadly though, there is also about half of the people doing deep learning research who are answered, I do manual tuning, which means they don't use any mechanism whatsoever to tune their parameters. They just sit in front of these computers and tune knobs. And they do that, we actually asked Susan and the others how they do that. Even the large industrial teams, the quantities they look at are at best four things. They look at the loss and the accuracy on training and test sets, so that's four things. And then at best, they look at the gradient norm in the network. And when it starts to wobble, they know that they're in dangerous territory and they have to reduce the learning rate. And then sometimes they have to take a snapshot and go back because the thing get, got out of hand. And then they have to do this over and over and over again. Not just at Facebook, right? I'm not dissing Facebook. It happens all across the industry. No one knows how to do this right. And about half of the people answering said that they are tuning more than five parameters. Sometimes um, 10 and more parameters. So it's a high dimensional space. And to do that, they run more than half of the, of the respondents run more than 10 tuning trials, sometimes several hundreds of them. So that's a very clear evidence of wasted resources, right? Like just by doing that, they're saying this thing runs 10 times as long as it could if I would only know how to call the algorithm correctly without even any further optimization in the code. Yes. Combined figures? 
of those two, um, well, we have the data set available, but um, not publicly. I would have to check. So there might well be a correlation between the people who have a certain number of parameters and how they tune them, yes, for sure. Um, so why is this necessary? What is the problem here? Well, the answer is, of course, it's bad algorithms. And they are bad because they are not probabilistic. Let me tell you why. So the emerging view on deep learning is that you could also think of it as what's called array-centric programming. I first heard that term from David Duvino an embarrassingly short time ago. It turns out it's actually an idea that has been around since at least the 70s. But here is my view on it, on how I think of deep learning as an array-centric program. So here's our equation again that you saw already. Deep learning is about minimizing a loss function that happens to be a sum over individual terms, where each term depends on one datum and all of the parameters. So our optimizer is going to ask for a gradient of that thing. When we compute that gradient, we effectively, at least in our mind, thinking of a big, huge array, which is indexed along the rows by the parameter space of the, of, the, of the neural network, so the weights, of which there are d. And along the columns, it's indexed by the data set. So it, it, it's indexed by individual data, which, uh, of which there are n, right? So now if your optimizer asks for a gradient, you could in principle do that with automatic differentiation, right? But n is large. n is maybe the entire internet if you're open AI. And so you can't do this sum every single time the optimizer asks for a gradient, right? So what you do instead is you do batching. So you only select a few columns of this array, these blue ones, and then compute a much smaller sum over m terms, where m is much less than n. Now, there are different ways of doing that. The textbook standard is to draw the batch iid, hopefully, from the entire data set. If you do that, you're creating a random variable, a Monte Carlo estimate of the loss function. And so we might call that the stochastic gradient, g. So there's a few things to observe here. First of all, this effectively means that in your computation, you now have a likelihood. There's a probability distribution for the thing you would like to know, which is the gradient on the loss function. But sorry, it's a probability distribution for the thing you get to see given the thing you'd like to know. It's a likelihood for the thing you'd like to know, which is a function of the stuff you actually get to see. And I opened this talk by saying, once you think about computation probabilistically, it's absolutely natural to allow for a likelihood in your computation. There's no reason not to have it. Whether that likelihood emerges from sampling, as is typically the case, or from some other form of incompletely evaluating this big array, that's not a problem for probability theory. It's a problem for statisticians, maybe, if you really want to have unbiasedness in your estimate and so on. But if you just want to use probability measures, you could have this in some other form as well. Some complicated projection, some sketching method, some, I don't know, quantum computer, I, I, anything that constructs a likelihood. The other thing to notice about this is that what kind of shape does this thing have? Well, it's a probability distribution. It's not a point measure. In general, it's just a general probability distribution, actually. Now, um, there is a, a sum in here. And if we manage to draw this, these data iid from the data set, then this is a sum over iid um, random variables. So therefore, if you wave our hands about, the central limit theorem kind of enters the room and saves us, and it's maybe a Gaussian distribution, right? Uh, it's not quite true, because there's a big problem sitting here which is that m is tiny. So n is normally, whatever, 10 to the 12, right, size of the internet. m is the number of GPUs in your workstation. So it's 8. Or 1,024 if you're Google and you have a TPU pod. So it's tiny compared to n. And that means that um, the noise on this thing, the variance of this Gaussian, is huge. It's actually often such that the standard deviation is larger than the mean. So the signal-to-noise ratio is less than one. There is 
more noise than signal. And that means that the classic view on optimization, the classic mathematical machinery for designing optimization methods doesn't apply. The classic perspective is you tell the algorithm what to compute, you write down the algorithm, and then you do a stability analysis. So you say, assuming that the thing has a small, that, that the number I'm computing has a small epsilon error, how does this epsilon propagate through the computation, forward or backward? But that only works if you can think of the perturbation as something small. If the perturbation is larger than the thing you're actually computing, you should really be thinking about a likelihood, about a probability distribution in the computation. So now comes the question, where is, so, okay, so this distribution typically isn't Gaussian. It's actually usually something more complicated because M is so small. But even, let's assume for the sake of argument for a moment it's Gaussian because then it makes things easy. Even a Gaussian distribution has two parameters. It has a mean and a standard deviation or a covariance matrix. Where is that covariance matrix in your code? And I'm, I'm assuming that almost everyone in this room has trained at least a basic form of a deep neural network at some point in their lives. Not everyone, but most people. So where is that thing? So you know maybe a piece of code like this from a tutorial. Here's some torch code for defining uh, a data loader. So that's the magic thing that loads data by batching it. Defining a model, forward pass, and then a backward pass. And then after the backward pass, you can ask this thing, what is my gradient? So that, what that returns actually is this thing, this stochastic gradient. Now remember that that stochastic gradient is just one term in our Gaussian. There has to be some, something else. Where is it? It's hidden from you by the PyTorch developers, not by your computer, because your computer computes those blue columns. It does it. It actually computes all those numbers, and then it just sums them up for you. But the fact that it's summed up is hidden from you. It's just con. Why? because these algorithms are inspired by the classic perspective on optimization, which requires a gradient. So let's make a gradient. So if you wanted to have an error bar on this gradient, well, okay, so you could say, if I want to have this entire matrix sigma down here, that's gonna be expensive because it's of size weight space by weight space. I can't quite compute that. Actually, it, it, it contains only those M terms, so it's a low rank matrix of size D by M, outer product, still too expensive. But if I wanted to just know the error bar on each element of the gradient, what I could do is I could take those terms in the sum and just square them. And that gives me an estimate for the variance, an empirical estimate, right? A Monte Carlo estimate for the variance. So how expensive is that? It's basically for free. Because you've already computed those blue columns that's your backward pass. That's the fancy auto diff that your deep learning stack does for you. And then after that, well, you just sum up, you just square a bunch of floating point numbers and sum them up. That's not going to be expensive. So we can actually construct such statistics. We can construct probabilistic observables in deep learning. It's just that the current way that deep learning stack works makes it hard to access those quantities. It's not impossible, actually, and it's easier depending on which uh, which parts you swap out of your, your, your stack. If you're writing in JAX, it might be easier than in Torch. So we actually, uh, uh, well, we, I mean, Felix Dangel and Fred Kunstner wrote a piece of code for Torch a while ago. Um, it was in iClear 2020, the bad iClear when there was nothing happening because of COVID, um, which provides access to these quantities. And it provides access to these quantities at barely no computational overhead. So here in this plot, this is from the paper, you can see, um, uh, in gray here, the cost of computing one gradient, depending on the batch size, so one stochastic gradient, um, for two different architectures. It depends a bit on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. And then next to it in blue, the cost of computing that gradient on that batch size, on that problem, and on top, for example, the variance of the gradient. That's the second line next to it, the second moment thing here. And you can see that the overhead of doing so is pretty minimal. It depends a bit exactly on what the, how the hardware is currently used, how much cash you have to like, repurpose depending on the batch size. But in principle, there's not really a reason why computing the second moment should be more expensive. In fact, you can compute various other quantities as well with this same tool. You can compute curvature estimates of the loss function of various structured form using particular like endowed structures on the network. 
all at very low computational overhead. So why am I showing you this? To argue that it's not expensive to be probabilistic about the computation. You can compute probability measures over your weights, over your gradients, over pretty much all the quantities you want to compute using a combination of advanced autodiff and taking care that the code actually allows you to access these quantities. It's not a fundamental problem of complexity. It's a change in mindset by the people who provide the software stack. And maybe there are some of you in the room who will be able to help change the stack such that it gives easier access to these quantities. So what do you do with those quantities? Well, I would like to say you fix the problems with Adam and build a magic new optimizer that just works. If I knew how to do that, I would have written the paper already because Adam is the most cited computer science paper ever, and I would like to jump on that train as well. So I can't quite tell you how to use those, these variables to solve deep learning yet. Who knows where we are going to be in two or three years. But I can tell you that those probabilistic quantities during training can be used to understand better what's going on in your deep network. As a mock-up, as a simple example of how to do that, Frank Schneider and Felix Dangel wrote this tool called Cockpit, which um, was published last year at ICML, which is designed to provide a, an idea of what software engineering should look like for differentiable programs, once you think about the computation in a probabilistic fashion. So if you construct these quantities that I just showed you in the other, on the other plot, all these extra quantities you can compute, then you can compute dashboards like this, Said. I mean, it's not particularly nice, beautiful graphics, but I can tell you what you can see here. At the bottom, you see the stuff that currently deep learning engineers look at. Here's a plot of the hyperparameters, as you would see it in weights and biases, for example. And then here, you see a performance plot, so that contains the loss and the accuracy on the training and the test set, and you can see some curve go down or go up. Nice. But you can also see above quantities that show you statistics about the Probably the, the, the distribution of the loss along the optimization path, and those allow you to set parameters of the optimizer, like the learning rate. They tell you whether your optimizer is calibrated, taking meaningful steps. You also see this thing in the middle, which is probabilistic statistics about the weight space and the gradient space, and those help you initialize the network better, so that you actually get initially meaningful distributions of the gradient, which help speed up the convergence rate later. And on the right, you see estimates about the curvature of the loss function during training, which, as you saw earlier, can be used to quantify uncertainty, to figure out whether the network is converged yet, whether it's at a minimum or not, or whether it's overfitting on data, for example. How exactly to do that, I'm not going to tell you now because you're waiting for coffee, but if you if Frank were here, he could give you like an extra talk about this. So this isn't yet the answer, but it's another like direction to take. So if you're here and you're a bit worried about like, you know, numerics sounds really complicated and you know, rigorous mathematics, maybe I want to do something a bit more hands-on, there is also an important opportunity to just build much better software for AI that provides quantities that are actually informative about what's going on in your deep neural network. So for traditional computer science, for traditional computer programs, we have these beautiful structured tools called debuggers and profilers and so on. And they tell you in detail what's going on in your code. For these extremely large differentiable programs, there is very little tools available, very few tools available that actually provide meaningful information about what's going on. And even in the leading industry labs, people look at four numbers and they don't actually know what's going on in their, in, in, in their deep net. So there's time to change things. So with that, I'm coming to the end. My argument has been that AI and machine learning is at an exciting point in time, a, ch a, a revolutionary change in, the, in, in our community. And at that time, there might be some fields like computer vision and natural language processing that are going through a massive disruption. But there's also another field which is just waiting to make its contribution, and that's algorithms for AI and machine learning. That's necessary to do because the algorithms we currently use in AI and machine learning 
are from a different age. They stem from communities and from times when data was not a central part of the computation. When data was something that happened on a piece of paper before the computer was switched on. Still, in 2023, that's the case, patently. And there are features of AI and machine learning that make this aspect of the classic form of doing computation really problematic. And I've tried to highlight a few. One of them is in scientific machine learning, this mix between mechanistic knowledge, which comes in the form of nonlinear differential equations and has to be solved on a computer, and empirical data, which provides information about the real world that has to be somehow squared with the simulation. So just having one algorithm that does the inference and one algorithm that does the simulation is not a good approach because both of these are just sources of information that should be combined. Another aspect is that in these extremely large scale resource intensive deep learning applications that currently drive the field, people are already treating this extremely large architecture and computation, which takes months and costs millions or billions of dollars as a data source. They're already thinking of it as providing one datum after the other to put into a Bayesian optimization loop. So we might as well look a bit deeper into that closed box to get more information out of it and do the optimization more efficiently. And the third one is that in even today, like I'm not even talking about quantum computers, but even today, the computation in large scale AI and machine learning already is fundamentally unreliable, imprecise, probabilistic, or actually in most cases also stochastic. But it doesn't have to be stochastic, it's certainly unreliable. Why? Because it involves these very large arrays that everyone acknowledges as being too large and therefore requiring some kind of sharding over machines and sampling to produce imprecise computations. We're all aware of that, but we don't have algorithms that make use of this property. We just ignore it. We just do stochastic gradient descent or Adam and hope that these stochastic algorithms still work. But we're not constructing the quantities necessary to actually do something about it and make use of this uncertainty in an efficient way. All of these aspects, they blur the line between information collection, so how the data enters into the machine from the disk, and information processing, so what we do with it on the chip. And that means we need a language that describes both processes, computation and empirical data, in the same mathematical objects, probability distributions. Probability theory is the right way to think about sources of information that need to be combined computational sources of information and empirical sources of information. And so therefore, this probabilistic way of thinking about computation, which we call probabilistic numerics, is in my opinion, the right language to write the next software stack for AI and machine learning, which by some people's measure is just going to be the new form of computer science. We'll find out whether that's actually true or not and whether that's dystopian or good. I hope that some of you here in the room are excited about contributing to this direction, which is a way to help this currently very fast paced and chaotic field make some sense of what's going on and that you will join us over the next three days, but also afterwards to build new software for AI and machine learning. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>